this week on Choice Hacking. It's one of the biggest fails in business history, Quibi. You might think you know the story. Business royalty raised almost $2 billion to start the latest and greatest streaming platform. And it falls flat on its face in record time, only seven months from launch to shutdown. But contrary to popular belief, Quibi wasn't a bad idea. In fact, it was pretty ahead of its time, even if it was a huge marketing disaster. I'm Jennifer Kleinhens, and you're listening to Choice Hacking, a podcast about what makes buyers tick, from psychology to behavioral science, neuromarketing, and more. Join me today as I break down some of the psychological traps that the Quibi team fell into, and you could too. But before we get started, I want to take a few seconds to tell you more about Choice Hacking and who we are. Choice Hacking isn't just a podcast. We also offer online courses, team training, coaching, and consulting to brands of all sizes, including startups, scale-ups, and Fortune 500 brands. We're based out of London and New York and have clients across the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, and more. Some of the amazing clients our team have worked with include brands like Starbucks, McDonald's, T-Mobile, AT&T, O2, Lloyds Bank, and big ad agencies like Havas and DDB. If you're interested in learning more about how we can help you grow your business with behavioral science, AI, and marketing psychology, then visit choicehacking.com to learn more. That's choicehacking.com. Now, on to the show. In 2018, the world of streaming content was a war zone. Big players like Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon were spending billions of dollars creating original content, locked in a cutthroat race for the eyes and wallets of the American public. Quibi entered what was one of the most contentious and competitive markets on Earth, and they knew they'd need to be armed with patience and big pockets. So they raised a ton of money, $1.75 billion to be exact. Now, that might sound like a lot to you and me, but in the world of streaming, where companies like Amazon and Netflix literally spend tens of billions every year just on content, it was a drop in the bucket. But Quibi's founding team were optimistic. They were, after all, entertainment and business royalty. Co-founder Meg Whitman was the ex-CEO of Hewlett Packard Computers and eBay, and a true expert in growing technology brands. To say that the other co-founder, Jeffrey Katzenberg, was well-connected might be the understatement of the century. He was the chairman of the Walt Disney Company for 10 years, the co-founder and CEO of DreamWorks Animation. Yeah, the guys that made Shrek. Oh, and let's not forget, he's the K in that SKG that appears below the DreamWorks logo, representing its three founders, Jeffrey Katzenberg, director Steven Spielberg, and billionaire business magnate David Geffen. To the layperson, Quibi seemed set up for success. They had a great team, a unique idea, and lots of money. But that was the problem. Quibi fell victim to a cognitive bias, or an error in thinking, called the halo effect. The halo effect describes how one positive trait of a person can affect our judgments of the rest of their personality, performance, and potential. Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg were some of the most successful business people in the world, and Quibi's investors included entertainment bosses like Disney, NBC Universal, Sony, AT&T, and banks like J.P. Morgan and Goldman Sachs. And when people at institutions of that caliber are involved with a startup, it gives a bit of shine to the project. That kind of track record makes people feel like they can't go wrong. But in the real world, being successful in the past doesn't necessarily dictate how successful you'll be in the future. The Quibi target customer was the busy daily commuter, who up until that point was forced to watch their favorite streaming shows a few minutes at a time, on the subway, on a bus, or on their lunch break. Basically fitting in content where they could. So Quibi had a great idea. Studio quality shows with episodes that were only 5 to 10 minutes long, so people could watch an entire episode while they waited in line for their morning Starbucks. That's right, Quibi was one of the first short-form video platforms. Like TikTok and Vine before it, Quibi wanted to get the world hooked on bite-sized, snackable content that they could watch right on their phones. In fact, the name Quibi is short for Quick Bites. And on the surface, this approach made total sense. In 2018, people were spending more than three hours a day on their phones, and platforms like Instagram and Snapchat were driving billions of views a day on short-form content. 
In an interview with Vanity Fair, Jeffrey Katzenberg told a reporter, quote, What you're doing today, if you're in our core demographic of 25 to 35 year olds, is you're actually watching 60 to 70 minutes of YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat. That growth is now a well-established consumer habit that Quibi is sailing into. But there was a big problem with this strategy. Quibi was only looking at data about how people behaved without thinking if their product gave people something that they couldn't get anywhere else. And in their minds, the answer was yes, because Katzenberg and Whitman fell for a cognitive bias known as the false consensus effect. This describes people's tendency to think that our own beliefs, behaviors, and thoughts are more common in the general population than they actually are. In other words, we think other people like what we like and do what we do. If we eat at McDonald's once a week, we assume that most other folks eat there just as often. If we fly first class, we think most other people have probably done that at some point in their lives, too. And if we think 10-minute episodic mobile shows are amazing, we think that other people will love them, too. Even if, in real life, customers just didn't see the point. By focusing on short-form content, Quibi created two problems for themselves. First, they painted themselves into a corner with their insistence on short-form content. There wasn't any existing studio-quality short-form episodic content, so Quibi had to create everything on the platform from scratch. Even though established players like Netflix spend billions of dollars every year on original content, they still got most of their views from older, long-form shows like Friends and The Office. But Quibi couldn't pad out its content with existing shows, so it faced a huge, expensive uphill battle to get enough content on its platform to get customers interested. The second way Quibi cursed themselves was by ignoring the social side of streaming. You see, the app didn't let customers grab screenshots, which meant that these new shows could not gain traction in wider pop culture because people couldn't make reaction gifs and memes or create any buzz for these short-form shows. Quibi was so afraid that people would steal their content that they turned a blind eye to how social media could help create a streaming hit. And streaming platforms live and die on their original programming. Disney Plus got popular after The Mandalorian became a hit, Hulu took off after The Handmaid's Tale, and Netflix conquered streaming with House of Cards. But Quibi didn't have a hit show that made the platform a must-subscribe, so there was no real way to drive demand. Marketing isn't just the ads that a company runs. Marketing is actually four different things. Product promotions, placement, and price. And Quibi failed all four. Now, we've already covered product, but what about the rest? Placement is about where your product's available to buy and use. And Quibi was only available on people's phones. There was no TV app, and customers hated that. This strategy also put Quibi in direct competition with free short-form platforms like Snapchat and Instagram. And by the time a TV app finally launched, the damage had been done. Next is promotions, so advertising. Quibi spent millions on high-budget, premium advertising, including a Super Bowl ad featuring Chance the Rapper. But because these ads didn't answer the simple question, okay, so what can I watch on Quibi, it didn't matter how many Super Bowl ads they bought customers just didn't get it. As for the price, Quibi only offered a free plan for the first 90 days post-launch, so no one could try it without paying. And then it cost $8 a month to watch shows without ads, which just didn't seem worth it to most people. One thing I have to mention is Quibi's timing. Remember their target customer, the time-poor commuter? Well, Quibi launched in April of 2020, just as its time-poor commuter stopped commuting and started working from home. Like a lot of businesses that launched in 2020, it was just really bad timing. Now, we've talked about the psychology behind why Quibi failed, but I want to mention one last cognitive bias those pesky thinking traps that anyone can fall into, no matter how smart or experienced they are. It's something called overconfidence, which describes people's tendency to be a little too optimistic about their chances of success. This bias appears in almost every single one of these failure case studies that I share. That dream team of Meg Whitman and Jeffrey Katzenberg felt like they couldn't lose because they'd been so successful up until that point. 
So they did things that overconfident people do, like spend way too much money on ads and content without figuring out if people even wanted their product in the first place. Thank you for listening to the Choice Hacking Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, please rate and review it. It takes me 20 plus hours to create every episode and it helps the podcast find new listeners when it has more ratings and reviews. And don't forget, you can learn more about behavioral science and psychology applied to business when you subscribe to the free Choice Hacking Ideas newsletter. You'll join more than 8,000 brilliant entrepreneurs and marketing folks from companies like Google, Coke, Disney, McDonald's, and Starbucks, but not Quibi, who get my newsletter. To sign up, just visit choicehackingideas.com. That's choicehackingideas.com. Until next time. I hit record a job, you can't ignore it. I'm transforming now, these cars and planes, I'm always boarding. Just out touring down in Charlotte, like I play for Hornets.